the attribute of the holiness of God. Uh, we've spent a couple weeks with some of the attributes, um, but this week we, we're going to hopefully wrap up the holiness of God, and we're going to be um, covering the, this final portion um, as we apply the holiness of God to uh, to our life and our practice, and that all, also we're going to examine the scripture to see the response of God's people to his holiness. Taking it off mute would help, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, so we'll see, we'll see the application of God's holiness in a couple points, and then we're going to see how God's people respond. But we want to keep in mind all that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, and primarily that when we talk about God as holy, we're talking about his moral perfection, his glory, the beauty of all his ways, his works, and his words. And uh, scripture even as we study other attributes, the power of God or the knowledge of God, we see the beauty of those attributes throughout as we see Scripture explain and teach us about God uh, because the holiness of God is the beauty and the perfection that surrounds all of God's attributes. And of course, we spent uh, two weeks ago, we looked at that a lot from the, uh, the places where God is worshipped, the ordinances that God as a God and as man was able to die on the cross for men. But this week now, we're going to look at a little bit of the application of God's holiness because of, because of God's holiness that impacts a lot of what we do as Christians, uh, especially what we do in church. Um, and so as we, I want us to, to think about it this morning as we apply God's holiness, see the holiness of God in the way that we worship God. Uh, and I'd like us, if we could, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And we'll begin just by reading a few verses of, uh, from David uh, as he sings before the Lord. We'll read 1 Chronicles 16, uh, beginning at verse 25. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. So the psalmist tells us we've spent two weeks talking about how God is holy. He's perfect. He's righteous. He's glorified. So how are we who are unholy, who are unrighteous, who are sinful in all our ways, how are we to worship the holy God in the splendor of his holiness? And I hope that we see by now that it's not going to work if we just try to come sit here and have a brainstorm about how we think we should worship God. Because unholy people cannot come up with righteous and holy ways to worship the holy God. But thankfully, God has revealed to us how we are to worship him, has he not? He's given to us his word. And so as the psalmist uh, David here says, bring an offering and come before the Lord. This is just one example of, in scripture of where God in his uh, ordaining worship has explained to us that one of the things that we're to do in worship is bring our offerings before the Lord. Bring our offerings before the Lord. And so holy worship has offerings. When the disciples are worshiping the Lord in the New Testament, the highlight of the worship service is the preaching of the word. And so the word of God is preached in holy worship. When Jesus is having his last supper with the disciples, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And so the sacraments are had in holy worship. When Moses calls the people of Israel together to teach them the word of God, he blesses them. He gives them a benediction. And so holy worship has a benediction. And you see this pattern, don't you? Those elements of our worship that we bring before the Lord, this Lord's Day and every Lord's Day, is a holy worship service because we are coming before the Lord, the Holy Lord, worshiping him as he has told us to do. The holy God can only be worshipped in the way that he has ordained. That's the only type of holy worship that can be brought before him. He says, 
that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. How do we know to do this? God's given us his word. So I heard someone tell me, uh, I was talking with, with uh, a minister in another church, not a, not a reformed church per se, um, and uh, he was, we were just discussing worship because their worship is a little, a fair amount different than what, what we would see. And, and he, he was explaining a view that's, that's there and that he would hold to, uh, that if God, there's a, there's, the reform view is, the way we worship God is how he has told us to worship him, and any other way is forbidden. That's the reform view. That's, uh, that's, that's the ref- a reform view of, of worship. The regulative principle is the fancy theological name to it. As God regulates it, that's how we worship him. There's another view that you'll find in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ch- evangelical churches, and they are seeking to hold fast to the word of God, but they'll take a perspective that if God does not forbid it, then we can worship God in, in that manner. From, and as its defense is, God is holy. God is perfect. God does not just accept any worship that comes before him. He only accepts holy worship, worship that is ordained in his word. When Moses is preparing to die, he knows he's going to die. The 40 years has expired in the wilderness, and Moses is giving the children of Israel his last will and testament for them, his last desire as their shepherd on earth, leading them to the promised land. And one of the things he does as Deuteronomy comes to a close is he commands them again how they are to follow the Lord, but he warns them against, he says, when I die, and he he prophesies too, he tells them they're going to go worshiping other gods. And shortly after Joshua dies, almost immediately after Joshua dies, they do that. But he says, remember Nadab and Abihu. Remember the false worship that they brought before me. This wasn't even worship of a false god. This was false worship of the true God. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire to the Lord. It was they offered worship to him that he had not ordained, and they were destroyed for it. And as Moses dies, he reminds the children of Israel how they are to worship God, exactly how he's ordained it. And so that's why we, what we do in this church is we, the elements of worship can all be found in Scripture as worship that is acceptable to the Lord. Um, I, think I, I was talking with Dan Phillips a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me that one of the big churches uh, around here, you've probably seen the bumper stickers for 12 Stone Church. They have numerous campuses, tens of thousands that would be considered members, but I don't think they use that, that term, but, it, but attend there. And um, they just built right across... Right across the street from my office at Sugarloaf and Satellite Boulevard, where they intersect, um, there is this huge construction project taking place. And at first, I thought it must have been more office buildings. Um, but then, by all the glass and stuff, and it was so tall, I feared it must have been building a mall. Well, then the sign went up, New Campus of 12 Stone Church coming soon. And this place is gigantic. Um, but Dan was telling me that, uh, I, th- I think it was at Christmas or something, just in the middle of the service, the, uh, the, the worship team, they came down and instead of taking an offering, they gave everybody $100. Everybody in the church got $100. They got a lot of publicity out of this. And the idea was, well, we're given, you know, we've been taking the money all year, so now we're going we're gonna to give you all $100 back. Okay, that is not an element that God has given to us in worship. Uh, that is something to tickle the ideas of man and to uh, certainly get publicity, but it's not the way that God has ordained for worship. Um, I've probably given the example before, but it's always stuck in my mind. Easter Sunday, a couple years ago, there was a church in Texas that advertised, you know, come and hear the gospel, and every visitor that comes in gets a raffle ticket, and in the middle of the sermon, we're going to pull a raffle and you can win a, win a car, a brand new car, in the middle of the sermon. That is not holy worship. It certainly entices people. It certainly draws in huge crowds, but it's not the way God has ordained to be worshiped. Um, God has given us uh, exactly how, I mean, the holy God ordains holy worship. That's not that difficult as we've studied the holiness of God, is it? The holy God ordains holy worship. Sinful men cannot establish holy worship because we are 
sinful. So we have to follow uh, the way that God has ordained. Any other manner other than what God has ordained is profaning the holiness of God. See, there's, this, there, there's the one element of the positive, we do what God tells us to do. But there's this negative, if we do not do what God tells us to do, we're profaning the holiness of God. We're making what God has ordained to be a holy time of worship to himself something common, and we're setting man's ways up against God's, against God's ways. This is exactly what Nadab and Abihu did. Uh, and we have that example for us um, in Scripture to be reminded the holy God ordains holy worship. Uh, so that's why we won't have, uh, and this is, you know, of course, the Reformation started in for several main reasons, but one of them had to do with the images and the worship of the images, uh, the worship of saints. We don't have images in worship. God uh, is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, so we do not worship him through images. Though he has given us visible signs, hasn't he? He's given us the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. There's the visible representations that he has ordained. We don't have women leading the worship or preaching because God has forbidden that. Um, that's the simple reason. Not because we don't like women. That's, what, uh, that's of course, what, what the world would tell us. We must be anti-women. It's, it's what God says. Um, you know, we don't have music that's so loud we can't hear each other sing. I, I heard uh, Mandy and I watched a couple years ago a, a, in, a, in a church called, uh, was, I think the name of the church was The Basement. Uh, has all the wrong ideas right there. But um, in a church called The Basement, they had a Christian rap group come in, which to me is a very tough two words to put together, Christian and rap. But anyway, I watched this on YouTube. This, I have no idea what they were saying, but it was so loud and obnoxious how in the world people could be deceived into thinking that this is glor glorifying to the holy God is amazing. Because where do we see in Scripture where people are singing praises to the Holy God and it's so loud people are getting headaches watching a video of it? I mean, it was so loud I'm getting a headache watching it on YouTube. Where does the Holy God ordain such worship? He doesn't ordain such worship. The music that is brought to him by his church is sweet music. It's beautiful music. It's glorious music. Um, it, it is what he has ordained. Um, but... What God has ordained is not always what men want to hear, is it? Uh, I lo long to see the day when there's revival in churches in regards to how to worship God. Uh, but as long as there is so much entertainment in the churches, the masses are going to follow the entertainment. They're going to look for the places where, uh, where they are entertained. Um, and, I, and I fear that, um, you know, that's where... Most, that's where most people go, isn't it? Where they can get entertained. And uh, I, who's the guy on, there's a radio show, um, Wretched Radio, do you remember that minister's name? Rob? Todd, Todd Friel, I think he's a Reformed Baptist minister. Um, Todd Friel, he does a radio show every day. Um, and I sometimes will catch the podcast of it. And he's often on Monday mornings, he'll often, he's, he's quite a funny minister. Um, and so he always has humor in, involved, and he, but he gives the gospel quite clearly. Um, but he'll often, he'll, he'll say, all right, let's compare holy worship. And he'll, he'll play a recording of some, you know, just outlandish, crazy preaching or something that happened. And then he'll, you know, uh, John Piper's preaching or someone like that, you know, and he'll, he'll compare and contrast the two. But he, he's made the point before, and, and I hope he's wrong, um, but he said where, that the worship in so many churches has become so worldly. There's, there's place, I mean, you can't even tell the difference um, anymore between, how do you, unless it, except for the name, that there's a church attached to the name, you can't tell a difference between that and some sort of, um, you know, concert or performance. Um, and there's so much sin that takes place in the worship and dishonor to God. He, he thinks that the next, the, you know, everyone's trying to tear down all these barriers of worship his sense is that the next thing that we're going to see is public displays of fornication and stuff in the church, kind of like what happened in the Old Testament when you had prostitution and all sorts of things, because he doesn't think it can get worse unless you have just public portrayals of sin uh, in the name of worshiping the true God. Uh, and if you read Kings, 
First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. That's what happened. Um, so that's that's his sense because people have are no longer believing that God is holy and therefore the holy God must be worshipped in a holy manner. Uh, but certainly, I hope as we've studied the holiness and perfection of God, we realize how far short we come, and so we do not have the ability uh, to come up with worship that is glorifying to God. We must submit to what he's given to us in his holy word, the scripture. So the holiness of God leads us and is applied to us in certainly in the worship of God, but also in our whole lives. I've purposely stayed away from a few verses the last couple of weeks that we probably came to mind when we're thinking about the holiness of God, because they apply to us. As we study the holiness of God, there's so many passages in Scripture that talk about our life. How are we to live in light of God being holy? A couple Scripture references. Leviticus 19, verse 2. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Leviticus 20, 26. And you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy. Leviticus 21, 8. Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. And then, of course, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, quotes from Leviticus, where Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The holy God ordains and decrees for his people to be holy. Our lives are to be holy. We're to live in a holy manner, for our God, indeed, is holy. Now, we might say at this point, well, if holiness, if we talk about the holiness of God and say the holiness of God means the perfection, the moral perfection of God, and God alone is perfect, God alone is holy, how can I be holy? It's impossible for me to be holy. I sin each and every day. It's only those that are deceiving themselves, as 1 John tells us, that would say they don't have sin. And there's, as often is the case in Scripture, there's, there's, two answers to that. There's one that is, that is true, you cannot be holy. But there's the other side of it that says what, God, what is impossible with man is possible with God. He died to make us holy, didn't he? He died to uh, make us free, and he sets us before the presence of God the Father when we die, perfect in holiness and righteousness. Now, so we have a standing before God today because of Christ who is holy. We have a standing before God as holy in his sight, as righteous. That's our standing before the Lord. But I think what Leviticus and Peter are getting at here is be holy is, uh, is very much in the context of sanctification. Put away sin. Take on Christ, his righteousness. Grow in the knowledge and love of his word. Repent of your sins when you repent. That is holiness. When God is describing to his church and to the Old Testament church and the New Testament church how they are to live before him, he gives them all of these commandments that they're to keep, and he tells them what they're to do when they don't keep the commandments. They're to repent. They're to be sorry for their sin. They're to put away their iniquity. And so as we read these passages in Scripture, it ought to it, it, it can be, I think, very troubling for Christians that are very aware, because God has made them very aware of their sin. They can be very troubling. I, can, I am not holy. That is an appropriate response. Only God is holy. Look to, him for, uh, look to him for your salvation. But he makes us holy, and he tells us then how we are to live so that we can be holy even as he is holy. Uh, Christ has reconciled us uh, to God through his own blood in order to present us as first or as uh, Colossians one uh, twenty one to present us holy and unblameable in the sight of God the Father. So you see Christ presents us holy before God the Father and he tells us to live in a holy manner because he is holy. It is Christ who has made us holy, not we ourselves. We we are not, this is not a, a, a claim that people in this life are going to be perfect. Our standing before God as believers is we are holy, but in this life we are So this is not a, an ideal when God says, be holy even as I am holy, that you are going to obtain moral perfection in this life. And that would be, that would go against uh, scripture. It would be a false hope. Um, there's Nothing that could lead from that except for misery, looking at our own sins. But perfection 
should be our goal, shouldn't it? I hope, I hope that's our desire, moral perfection. I hope that's our desire. Um, because when we get to heaven, we're going to be perfectly holy. We're going to be perfect in all our ways, in all our words, in all our works. There's going to be no sin in them. Um, so I hope perfection is, is the goal. And so the, but holiness is, has that as your goal and your sight is looking to Christ, who's the author and finisher of your faith, who's given the holy law so you can know how to glorify him. Seek that as your rule for life. Love it as the psalmist did. Lo, how love I thy law is my meditation day and night. But when you sin every single day, do what the Lord says and repent of your sin. That's what this, this call to. It's not uh, once you sin, that's it. It's all over. You've, you've messed up. You can't be uh, holy. The call is to, uh, to repent of our sin. Um, we ought to be holy because our Savior and our God is holy. So we ask him and we pray to him. We ought to pray to him that he would make us more and more like him. Uh, that he would increase our faith, that he would help our unbelief, that he would help us uh, to die more and more to the old man and thank him and praise him and worship him for making us holy by his blood and taking our hearts of stone and making them into hearts of flesh. What a glorious thing the Lord has done. So there's these two applications of worship, that is to be holy worship because God is holy, and our life that are to be holy lives because God is holy and we're to be like him. Uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. But what I want to look at, and we'll have to do this quickly because there's several, several points here. I want us to look then as we close, how do God's people respond in Scripture when they come face to face with the holiness of God? How do God's people respond? So then, that what we should take from that, how should we respond when we come face to face in God's word with the holiness of God. When we come face to face with the beauty and the moral perfection of God, how should we respond? So I want to look at a, at a few examples here. Um, the first is that we ought to fear the Lord. Uh, our God is full of awe and wonder, uh, justice and judgment. We've studied these attributes of him and we have more to study. He's most pure, and we're but filthy rags. Um, we've, you know, in some ways become so used to these descriptions of ourselves and of God, and of God that it can be difficult, I, th I think, from, for sometimes, at least from speaking for myself, that it's difficult for it to really grasp our attention. Just the contrast between the holy God and sinful man of whom I am. But I, but I hope that you've seen in these texts that we've looked at, not just today, but in, in Scripture, um, in the past couple of weeks, that you've come to realize with great reverence how great and glorious God is. How great and glorious He is in all His words, in all His works, in all His ways. And I think it should cause us to have a very reverent fear for Him. And I don't think this because this is uh, you know, what I came up with. I think it because this is the way God's people respond um, to God when they see his holy works, when they read his holy words, when they study his holy ways, they respond with the fear of the Lord. Um, if you want to jot this down in your notes and read later, read Exodus chapter 14. It's one that we've referenced before, but this is when the Israelites are running away from the Egyptians. Pharaoh has released them. They go and they come to the Red Sea and here comes Pharaoh's army chasing them. And so the Lord puts this darkness in front of the, the, uh, the Egyptians, in between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The Egyptians can't pursue them that night. Moses is told by God to put his rod on the Red Sea, and all night long God sends a strong wind that's unlike any other wind that's ever come in the, before, because this wind is going both directions, and it's separating the waters of the Red Sea separating them so much, not that there's waves, but there's dry land in the middle. Enough space in between that all of the Israelites can get through the Red Sea on dry land and get to the other side. And they get to the other side, but here comes Pharaoh's army, and they're running in, aren't they? And what happens? God tells Moses, put your rod back. Rod goes back, and the waters come back together. And the Egyptian army is drowned. And all of Israel sees this. They all see the destruction of 
Pharaoh's army. And at the end of that chapter, we read the response of the Israelites. And the Israelites saw what the Lord had done, and they feared the Lord because they came face to face. They saw the holy works of the Lord taking place on the Egyptian army, and they feared the Lord. They saw his power and his might and the perfection of it, the holiness of his power, the holiness of his justice, how he, and his mercy, how he saved them, and how he destroyed Pharaoh's army, and they feared the Lord. When we see these wonders so many times, these works of the Lord in Scripture. Um, I was reading through uh, First and Second Kings um, in, my, in my personal worship, and from time to time I'll I'll, uh, if I have some extra time with the boys, I'll try to read to them during the day what I'm, what I'm reading. And of course, we have our family worship at night. But we were reading uh, yesterday for a little bit about um, Elisha, the prophet. And it's amazing as you read those chapters in, um, in 2 Kings when Elisha comes on, and, and even in 1 Kings with Elijah. I mean, it's every three verses. There's a new, there's a new miracle that the Lord is doing. Whether it's the Shunammite's um, son who's raised from the dead, or the Jordan River is being parted, just like the Red Sea was parted, um, or uh, the prophecy against Jezebel is coming true, you're constantly seeing the word of the Lord, the holy word of the Lord, and the holy works of the Lord taking place. And the response of us should be to fear the Lord. What a great God this is, that what he says he does, what he prophesies he performs. Uh, no men have control over God. He has all power and all righteousness and all justice. And so when the Israelites come to Mount Sinai, shortly after they cross the Red Sea, they come before Mount Sinai and there's thunderings and fire on the top of the mountain and they fear the Lord and they worship the Lord there. And then they send Moses to go speak to God because they're so afraid, <laughs> right? They don't want to speak to him face to face and so they send Moses. But God continues to speak to us in his word today, and he shows us his mighty, holy works. And when we see those in scripture and we hear them preach to us, it should give to us a reverent fear. This is the Lord of the universe. We are but dust, and yet he has seen fit to condescend to speak to us uh, in his word and show us his glory. So one of the proper responses of God's people to God's holiness is the fear of the Lord. Um, the, uh, another response, uh, we had it in the application of God's holiness, but one of the responses of God's people to the holiness of God that we ought to have is we ought to respond by worshiping God. Uh, the only response to the holiness of God and the perfection of God, when you are standing before a great king, uh, you remember what the, what the kings did of old and the, the people that came to Solomon to see his wisdom, they would bring him gifts. They would, if they were uh, tributaries, they would pay him tribute. When the Queen of Sheba came, she gave him great gifts. What can man give to the holy God? Everything is his. He's made all things. What can man do for God? Well, we can do what he's ordained us to do. We can respond by worshiping him. He died uh, on the cross to make true worshipers who would worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, Solomon completes the temple. We read a couple verses from this Wednesday night during the, during the prayer meeting. But um, Solomon completes the temple. And you remember what happens when the priests come into the temple to dedicate it after the temple has been finished. The glory of the Lord comes down from heaven and fills the temple. And the glory of the Lord is so great in the temple, the priests have to leave as they can't stand in the presence of the glory of the Lord. And how does all Israel respond to the glory of the Lord in his temple? They worship him. Uh, they worship him. Probably the, the biggest sacrifice in terms of quantity uh, that were given in, in all of Scripture. Um, but Solomon leads that worship, even praying the great prayer of 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, and he leads the people in worship, and they offer sacrifices as God had ordained in the Old Testament for his worship. I mean, it's something like 100,000 sheep killed, uh, and not even to mention all the oxen and everything else that they do in worship as they stand before the holy God. Um, not many chapters later in 1 Kings, but many years later, we come to Elijah, 
And remember Elijah's life, he spends much of his time uh, as one of only uh, several thousand left that profess the name of the Lord and haven't uh, kneeled the knee to Baal in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ahab is king over that kingdom. And Elijah makes a charge. He says, we need to, essentially summarizing, lay it out once and for all, who's the true God, Baal or Jehovah? And he says, you bring your prophets, I'll bring up 400, and whoever can call down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, that their God is the true God. And of course, we know this story very well. The prophets of Baal can't do it. Nothing happens. They're cutting themselves, bleeding everywhere, screaming, and nothing happens. And so Elijah comes and he pours all the water on top, right? He's like, let's, and it's in a famine too, so this is expensive stuff. Um, and they're pouring tons and tons of water, filling up a moat around the altar. And it's just completely saturated so that a normal fire wouldn't start. No man-made fire could start. But this was done to show all the Israelites that are watching around what the Lord is going to do. And what happens, of course, Elijah prays the Lord. He doesn't have to cut himself. He doesn't have to scream. He prays the Lord, and the Lord sends fire from heaven and consumes the whole altar. There's not one drop of water left after the fire consumes that sacrifice. But how do the people respond after seeing the glory of the Lord taking and consuming the sacrifice? All the Israelites fall down and they confess the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They fall down, they kneel down before him uh, and confess his holy name. They worship him uh, even with their mouths. The Lord, he is God. When God brings thousands you know, to faith in the early days of the church, in, in the book of Acts, the disciples are constantly worshiping God for adding to the number such as should be saved. When Peter is delivered from jail by the miraculous work of the holy God, the people praise and worship the Lord. When we come face to face with the holiness, the perfection, the glory of God, we must respond with worshiping the holy God because it's the only response uh, that, that he accepts and that brings glory to his name. So we fear the Lord. We're called to worship the Lord. Um, the, the other, the next is we should respond to believe the Lord. We have faith in the Lord. So when we see the works and we read the words and we study the ways of the Holy God, we ought to believe them. Um, we ought to have faith in Jesus Christ because he's holy. We believe and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. When Abraham was told, uh, was told to do things of God and, was made, and promises were made to him, he believed God. And scripture tells us and it was counted to him for righteousness. When Elisha was given prophecies and words of God to give to, um, uh, to, give to the Shunammite woman in terms of uh, the baby that would be born to her, we're told scripture, he believed God. And she believed God um, after she had the baby. Hers was a little bit delayed. But she responded in faith. And so as we see and read the word of God, we study his ways, meditate on the works and the wonders that he has done, we ought to respond by trusting in him, resting in him, praying to him, honoring him, having faith in him. So when we see the holiness of God, we fear God, we worship God, have faith in God. And as you mentioned before, when we're face to face with perfection and the righteousness of God, we ought to repent of our sins because we're unholy. We're unworthy to come before God's very present. He, he knows yours and mine deepest, darkest, worst, terrible thoughts that we have ever thought, the worst things that we have ever done uh, in secret. God knows it because he's full of knowledge um, and he is perfectly holy and he came to save sinners. Uh, who have sinned against him. And he gives us the command. He tells us to repent of our sins. And so when we come and see the work that God has done, who he is, we ought to respond with repentance. And this is tied with faith. We respond confessing our sins and believing that he who is righteous has saved us. Remember the example of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is it's in Jericho, right? Isn't, it, isn't Zacchaeus in Jericho when the Lord is uh, walking through, right? And Jesus is coming through, and Zacchaeus is a little guy, so he climbs up on a tree to see Jesus, and Jesus stops and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to go to your house today. And Zacchaeus comes literally face to face 
right, with Jesus Christ, the holy and righteous God, and Jesus doesn't even have to say anything. And Zacchaeus is so convicted of his sin because he's a tax collector and he's been taking a little bit more than the fair tax that they're supposed to give because he's padding his own wallet. And he, Jesus doesn't even say anything to him. And he acknowledges his sin. He repents of his sin. And he shows the fruits of repentance by telling Jesus, if I've stolen from everybody, I'm going to give them back double. That's what he's going to do. When, when Zacchaeus comes face to face with the Holy God, he's convicted of his sin and he responds in repentance. And he turns from his sin. He doesn't just give the words, but he has the actions. I'm going to give back everything that I've stolen and then some. Uh, be, there's, this is what God has called us to do. Repent of our sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is holy and perfect in all his ways. And he's promised. If we repent of our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Um, the the, the last response that I, want to, that I want to cover, and I wish I had given us a little bit more time, um, it is the response to the holiness of God, the response of obedience to God. Uh, this is tied in with everything we've been discussing, but you know, it's, it's interesting. I was reading uh, J.C. Ryle on the holiness of God, or the ho holiness, it's actually on uh, how we are to be holy, um, but he makes a point in the 1800s that I think is probably only more relevant now that isn't it amazing that in the day and age that we live in, in the church, that some people, when they hear that we ought to be obedient to God, they get very tense, very worried. Is this going to be works righteousness that is being taught? Are we going to be taught how we're supposed to save ourselves by our works and forget about Jesus Christ? Um, there are churches very similar uh, in name to ours, probably within our own denomination, where it would be very unlikely to be told that we are to obey God from the pulpit. You'll hear about putting your faith in Jesus Christ, might hear about repentance every once in a while, but obedience is not a word that is liked in many circles today. Um, obedience to God but doesn't God call us to obey him? Doesn't God, isn't that much of his word, what he's ordained for us to do? Uh, and it's a response to seeing his glory, right? It's a response in seeing his work that he's done for us in his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Well, what do we, if he's our Lord, we ought to obey him. And that ought to be something that we hear in the pulpit, is application of God's word, how we're to live in light of God's glory and in light of his holiness. We're to obey him. I think it's a very, very sad thing. Uh, and I know I mentioned it, I think, on the first week of this class when um, a church we were visiting where the minister uh, read the Ten Commandments. And as, as he introduced it, he said, here's the bad news. And he read the Ten Commandments. And then the Ten Commandments finished. He said, all right, and now here's the good news. And he read from John 3. As if the law is bad, Obedience and submission to God's law is a bad thing. No, it's not. God has told us how we are to live, and he's ordained for us as we look at what God has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. If he's our Lord, what do we do to our Lord and our master? We obey him. We want our children to obey us uh, because that is right and proper of children to do to their parents. It's right and proper for sinful people to obey the holy Lord, to submit themselves to him, to seek after and desire uh, to be holy and to keep God's ways, that his desires and his affections would be our desires and our affections, um, that when that the, the God who hates adultery, that we would hate adultery, that we would not commit adultery, the God who hates murder, that we would hate murder, that we would obey him and not murder, uh, the God that hates coveting and discontentment, that we would also hate those things and obey him and be thankful and content with all that he's given to us. Um, God has given us his word that we might obey him, that we might believe him, and that we might obey him. Uh, we sing it often, uh, the famous hymn, Trust and Obey, right? Uh, we're not, it's not obedience to be saved. It's obedience because God is holy. He's the holy God, uh, and he has saved us, and so we respond to obeying him. Uh, 
But let's look at Scripture, because again, these are responses from Scripture to the holiness of God. Again, 2 Kings, uh, obviously this has been on my mind because I'm reading Kings personally, so you're getting a lot of examples from Kings. Um, but 2 Kings tw chapter 22 through 24, another good uh, Sunday afternoon reading if you're interested. We have the account there of King Josiah. And King Josiah comes to the throne um, at a time when the people have forgotten and forsaken the word of God. Literally forgotten the word of God. There is a generation now that has never even read the Word of God or heard it read. It's been forgotten. And Josiah is, um, has the priests uh, working in the temple, and one of the priests um, discovers in the wall a scroll. And it's the scroll of the Word of God, and it's read before the king. And Josiah comes face to face with the holy God who has ordained holy living, who has ordained holy worship, and the people of Israel have not been doing that. Um, but notice in those chapters how Josiah responds to the Word of God. Because again, Josiah hasn't seen wonders. Sometimes people say, well, if I had just been the Israelites, seeing Pharaoh and his army overcome with the waters of the Red Sea, I would believe and I would fear. That's why they believed. So I, I don't see that unless God gives me those signs and wonders. How can I believe? Josiah hears the word of God. It's read to him by the priests. His response, he destroys all the false gods. Destroys them all. Grinds them into dust. That he doesn't just take them and bury them so they can be dug up with the next king. Destroys them and grinds them into dust because that's what God said. He said, if there's false gods in your midst, destroy them. Uh, he puts away the witches. Witchcraft is something that would come in into uh, Israel and Judah when the kings are walking in their own ways. He puts away the witches. He ends sodomy. He gets rid of the temple prostitution. There's that example again that we referenced earlier. He removes even all of the high places where the people are going even supposedly to burn incense to the true God. Not necessarily to Baal or a false god, but they're trying to do what Nadab and Abihu did worshiping the true God in a false way. Nadab and Abihu were destroyed for it. Josiah destroys the high places. He removes them. He keeps the Passover. He says, we haven't, we haven't had a Passover in this kingdom forever. Our God ordained this to be a yearly sacrifice when all the people would come together to partake of the Passover. Josiah reinstitutes the Passover, and we're told that he obeys God's word. The response to seeing the holy God in his holy word is obedience to God. And that ought to be a response that we have, is to obey our God, and when we fall short, to repent of it. And when Paul is converted on the road, and the light shines down from heaven, and Jesus speaks to him, and Paul truly sees Jesus as a man out of time, because Jesus speaks to him from heaven after he has been resurrected, God then tells him to go somewhere and to see somebody, and to do certain things, and Paul obeys. After he has been saved, he responds in obedience to the Lord his God. In Exodus chapter 24, when Moses is about to go up to Sinai again, after he's given the law, uh, after he's, he reads it all to the people, and of course we, he does this, this sacrifice where the blood is poured on the altar and the blood is sprinkled on the people, demonstrating that the Christ shed blood for sins that will cover the sins of the people. Moses, two times that day, reads the law of God to the people. And they respond, all that the Lord has said, we will do. They profess that they are going to do what the Lord has said. They're going to respond in obedience. It's not an obedience for salvation. As people who have been saved by the Lord, they respond with obedience and submission to him. The Lord has told us in Micah what is good and what the Holy Lord requires of us, even to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. How do we do this? We meditate on his scripture, and then we, as we see the holy works of the Lord, as we read the holy words of the Lord, as we study the holy ways of the Lord in his word, we respond as a holy people to our God by fearing the Lord, worshiping the Lord, having faith in the Lord, repenting of our sins before the Lord, and obeying the Lord. And then we can, uh, we can truly sing and pro proclaim, even as we already did as we opened Sunday school this morning, 
with the elders in heaven that we read of in Revelation chapter 4. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rested not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and they worship him that liveth forever and ever. And they cast their thrones be their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So may this be uh, our response to the word, the works, the wonders of God that we see and we read in Scripture and we hear preached to us each Lord's Day. May we respond with, with worship and love and obedience to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our holy God, we praise your holy name for you are righteous in all your ways, perfect in all your words, glorious in all your works. Our Father, we thank you for revealing to us your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, O Lord, for revealing to us the will that you have for our lives we thank you, O Lord, for making us holy even as you are holy, for sanctifying us, for cleansing us of our sin, for removing our hearts of stone and giving to us hearts of flesh that we might serve you and love you. And O Lord, we confess that we still do sin against you, for we are not yet glorified. We still do those things that are acting and rebelling to you. And O Lord, we ask that you would forgive us our sins, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us, O Lord, to hate every evil way, to love every holy way. And, O oh Lord, we ask that you would open up our eyes to see as we read the Scriptures day by day, as we hear the Word preached each Lord's Day, that we might respond by worshiping you, by giving thanks to you, by believing you. Oh Lord, we are so thankful that you have seen fit to call us, who are unworthy and unholy, to stand holy before your very presence. O oh Lord, bless now the worship of you this morning. May it be in spirit and in truth, and may it bring all glory to the Lamb who was slain, who lives forever and ever, and who is coming again in judgment. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, with thanksgiving. Amen.